I'll be lecturing at Eastern Florida State College on the 4th. Uh, I'll be lecturing here on Jerusalem and Islam, and these are private lectures on the 17th of October, and then I'll be lecturing at the um, University of Florida Gainesville on Thursday, October the 18th as well. So those are the sort of things that are in the pipeline right now in addition to our work here at Rollins. Um, I made a suggestion to um, Reverend Jenkins this week for her to, well last week, for her to consider having an interfaith sort of Sunday school program for children. And I was thinking particularly about um, our youngsters, uh, Sergio and Karim. Uh, it would be a dynamic program for them to be able to experience other people and perhaps learn from them. Um, and so we'll see what happens. If that were to take place, I would need someone to volunteer each week to um, handle that class. And so just pray about it. If you it could happen or it might not happen, she liked it. What I would like to do is to help her. Uh, up until about three weeks ago, our attendance has always exceeded the attendance of her worship service. And I think there are a number of challenges there. Um, as you know, this is a very unfortunately white privileged school, or however you want to look at that, but that's what it is. And um, the rule, the school has a lot of rules in terms of the music department, sort of runs what happens here with the organ and the music, and uh, she doesn't have a lot of liberty, uh, and it's a challenge for her. So we're looking at ways that perhaps we could help her. And so just be in prayer about that, make dua. Uh, concerns and uh, prayers, Susan Nelson, um, please continue to pray for her. Um, she's uh, having some difficulty speaking, so if you go visit her, uh, just remember that she is having difficulty breathing. Um, the, the mass is actually pushing on her lungs, and, and she's having difficulty speaking. So there may be a point where we bring a tablet and communicate in writing. So please continue to pray for her. Um, Jessica's mom. Uh, she has asked us to uh, request um, dua for her and then for Reverend uh, Jenkins. When I was um, a chaplain years ago, there was a government policy called RIFR, the least restrictive <coughs> religious practices for inmates. And there's a return, uh, as you know, in the last election, there was an, a re-outreach to evangelical Christians uh, and they supported tremendously the current president uh, of the United States. And um, what has happened is there's been a backlash and in college campuses, evangelicals have actually been banned um, because of the, um, predominantly I, I deem by a lot because of the LGBTQ plus um, advocacy, legal advocacy, uh, there's a huge focus on discrimination clauses and so actually what's happened right now with the recent policy um, a non-Muslim could actually elect to run the MSU uh, so there's be in prayer for that because uh, what's happening and what I'm seeing in my work is that the world is becoming more and more secular and they're trying to push out any kind of religion and I just feel like it's important to share this with you um, in my last year of being chair of the Orange County Domestic Violence Task Force, my vice uh, chair, who is an attorney, and my secretary happened to be a law enforcement. And uh, we were meeting, thank God, during the month of Ramadan while I was fasting. And uh, they said to me, uh, this is not a religious organization. And I had asked the Muslim a women's organization to get involved with the DV March because I knew they would get something done and they would make it happen. I was trying to find someone to volunteer. Um, it was very painful. Um, in interesting how Allah works. Um, my daughter had to handle some stuff in the courthouse and happened to overhear a conversation between my previous secretary and someone very involved. And he was saying how he was so surprised that I did not react and that I handled it so well. 
but he obviously did not know. He was not Raqib. He did not know. He could not see what was actually going on in my heart. It was very painful. So there is this push. So we need to um, take a stand in that direction. And I feel like it's important for me to share with you uh, as my family stuff that's going on uh, so that you're awake to it and that you are standing up as a person of belief, as a person of faith and saying no. So I told them, I said, I came into this organization as an imam. I came into this organization presenting a sermon to Harbor House so that when women that are Muslim come in, they would have the teachings there and I'm going out as an imam. And that's who I am and I can't detach myself from that. So she's having a very difficult time right now with, um, uh, Reverend Jenkins is having a very difficult time right now uh, because of some of this law and some of this policy. Uh, and of course, it just goes to show you that when you have a tremendous swing in political offices, what can happen? So we do need to be in prayer for our country. We need to uh, be advocates and be actively um, participating in anything that helps us be a vital uh, and fundamental part of something. So I, I apologize for going on a little bit of this, but I feel that it's very important for you to be aware of what's going on. And so today, <laughs> um, we will be talking, inshallah, about the ever-responding one, the respondent, the responsive one, and the answer of prayer. So in alhamdulillahi ta'ala, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastafiru. ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ومن يحده الله فلمد من يحده الله فضل الله من يذل فلا هدي الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. Indeed, all praise is due to Allah. We praise Him. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil in our soul and from our sinful deeds. Those who are guided by Allah, no one can misguide them. Those who are not guided by Allah, there is no guide for them. I bear witness that there is no God, there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Muhammad sallallahu is his servant and messenger. I'm Abad. So here you see um, Al-Mujib and um, the ever responding one in the Arabiya here. And some definitions that you would want to be familiar with. Um, the fulfiller of prayers, the answerer of prayers, the responsive one. And I'm sure that James and Julie prayed that this car thing would be resolved and that it would not be a burden on their son. I know that they did because they actually spoke to me about it and God answered their prayer. So the one who answers prayers, the one who responds to needs, the one who penetrates through every obstacle in order to respond, the one who responds to an invitation, the one who responds to requests, prayers, and praise by means of gifts and acceptance. And we see here that this comes from the trilateral root, mim, jim, and bat, which has the following classical Arabic connotations, to answer, reply, respond, accept, to cut, pierce, penetrate, to have a dialogue or conference, to comply with a desire when invited to do so. And this is one of the names um, that is used in the Holy Quran. In Surah 11, verse 61, and into the tribe of Thabud, we sent their brother Salih. He said, O oh, my people, serve Allah. You have no other God save Allah. He brought you forth from the earth and hath made you thrive thereon. So ask forgiveness of Allah and turn unto Allah repentant. Lo, my Lord is nigh, responsive, ready to answer. So when you think or when you say with your lips, Allah did not answer my prayer, you are making the Quran a lie. So be very, very careful not to ever say this. If you are conscious, if your soul is awake, you will know, and after today's teaching, you will definitely know, that Allah is answering your prayer. Allah just may not be answering it the way that you want it to be answered. But Allah knows best. And in, his hik in Allah's hikmah, that prayer is being answered in the best way for you to be served. Inshallah. 
And uh, I use classic texts, as you know, when I'm teaching, and I like to pull from classic texts and share with you and elaborate on that. So um, this is my favorite book on the subject, The Great Names of Allah by El Sayyid Rashad uh, El Masauri. Um, and he said here that linguistically both the nouns ijaba and istijaba, istijaba means basically the same. And the word al-mujib has two meanings. One of them is this, the one who answers the pleas. The other is the one who grants what is pleaded for. And so every one of us, if we went around the room today and in the discussion, we'll talk about some of this, knows how many times in your life God has answered your prayer when you felt there was no way, when there was just no apparent way to deal with the situation. God came through and made it easy for you or made it easy for us. Al-Mujib is the one who responds to the plea of those who plead to the divine and helps them, who favorably answers the supplication of those who supplicate to the divine, who removes the need of those in need and gives them sufficiently. Nay, the divine even gives before being asked. How many blessings have we had today since we woke up this morning until we got here that we did not ask for? We do not think to say, Allah, give me that next breath, please. Allah, would you please lubricate my eyes so that my eyes continue to work well for me. There's so many things, blessings that Allah has given us that we did not ask for. The food or the drink or the coffee or the popcorn, I don't think anybody made a dua and said, when I get there today, Ya Allah, please make sure there's some fruit or something for me to eat. This, Allah had it there for you already, alhamdulillah. Nay, the divine even gives before being asked and accepts even before being pleaded to. The divine knows the need of those who are in need before they pray. And the divine since eternity knows all their needs. So the divine has provided them with means to satisfy all their needs. So not only does he satisfy the needs, he gives the means of satisfying the needs. So you may not realize it that you may not get the actual thing, but the means, like that coverage and the insurance that you didn't even know about. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is how it's so important for us to frame in this reference, because when we don't, and this is so important, I, I'm really, I've been very distracted by my recent spiritual contemplations, and it's a beautiful distraction. Coming, becoming so aware of how there are messages that are coming to the Qalb. And those messages come from two sources. They either come from the Ruh or they come from the Nafs. And if you're not aware of what signals are coming to your heart, then what will happen is your Aqal, your mind will be deceived and you will say something from your Nafs and you will even be deluded to believe that's from your heart. So for example, a, a judge, can he make a ruling when he's angry? No, because his actions are being affected by his aqal, what he's thinking. And what he's thinking, he can be deluded to believe is from his heart. Do we make the same decisions when we are angry that we make when we're at peace? No. So it is so important for us to have a very deep, thank you, knowledge of our aqal, how we think, to have a knowledge of our kalb, and to have a knowledge of our nafs and our ruh. And so rarely are people equipped with this knowledge. And what did the Prophet ﷺ say? To know yourself is to know Allah. So I encourage you, I have been reading every single verse that has the word kalb, heart, in it. I've been reading every single verse that has mind in it. I've been reading all the verses with ruh, all the, and it's just overwhelming. It's in a beautiful way. It's just a beautifully overwhelming experience. <laughs> we usually think of overwhelming as difficult, but this is just such a blessing to, to see all of this and how we need to be 
forever connected and we need to make sure that what we say with our lips is what would be from our ruh and not our nafs. The divine creates food and other types of sustenance for them. The divine creates tools and the means to get such tools to the hands of those who need them. It is said that Al-Mujib is the one who responds to the pleas of those who plead to the divine and that the divine since time immemorial knew in advance that they needed what they needed. The divine is the one who comes to the rescue of those who are in dire need of help. And the divine does not disappoint anyone who pleads to the divine. So yesterday, Hanima was in a car accident. Someone hit her from behind. And what a blessing, she said, because her mom happened to be there. They were going to feed the homeless. So her mom was there and she talked about the calming effect. So she didn't get in that car and say, Ya Allah, if I have an accident today, please let my mommy be there for me. But he gave that to her, that blessing of her mom being there. And actually a lady that plays uh, pickleball with Naran heard that she was feeding the homeless. She said, I've never done this in my life. Can I join you? And so what an opportunity for Dawah. So the woman, um, Naran said to the woman, oh, that's my daughter that just got hit. And the woman said, how, how can you be so calm? So it was, it was a da'o experience. This subject is repeated several times throughout the text of the Holy Quran. And whenever we're doing contemplation and pondering and reflection on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is why probably the, one of the greatest books in my library is something called al Qasis, Concordance of the Quran. And it tells me every trilateral root and every single verse that I can find that trilateral root. It's been one of my favorite books for years. Matter of fact, I have a backup copy because the one the binding is falling apart from me using it so much. In Surah 37, verse 75, And Nuh called upon us, the most excellent are we to answer the prayer. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an example that one of the great prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prayed and they answered his prayer. And we know that in the Old English, they and we is referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah 3 verse 195, So their Lord accepted their prayer, that I will not waste the deed of one who does a good deed among you, whether male or female, each one of you being from the other. And what I love about this verse is that we are reminded about the biological equity in Islam because sometimes cultural projections lead our aql to be deluded to believe that women are less than men and that is a lie that is not what Allah said as a matter of fact Allah elevated women in this religion like no other religion has gave them the right to not be forced to marry somebody gave them the right to divorce and I won't get into that subject today but no, ladies, when you begin to feel badly about yourself, reflect back to the equality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. And don't listen to that lie. Don't let your aqal be fed by your nafs and the bad experiences that you've had in life. Let your aqal be fed by your ruh, your heart. Be fed by your ruh about what Allah and His Messenger has said about you. Salah alayhi wa in Surah 21, verse 83 to 84, Ayyub cried to his Lord, Harm has afflicted me, and you are the most merciful of the merciful. So we responded to him and removed whatever harm he had had. And we gave him his family and the like of them, with them, a mercy from us and a reminder to the worshipers. And this is the power of the respondent, that not only did he bless Ayyub, but what does it say here? We blessed his family. We blessed the people that were like his family. And we blessed the people that were like his family that were with them. So all the bases were covered. And he gives this as a reminder to worshipers. Our being here today is a part of ibadah, is a part of worship. 
And so remember that as the worshipers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter what your aqal tells you, if it's not coming from the ruh to your heart and your heart's feeding that, you must recognize that it's a lie, seek refuge with Allah from the accursed Satan and claim what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. In Surah 27 verse 62, who answers prayer of the distressed one, when he or she calls upon the divine and removes the evil, and who will make you successors in the earth, is there a God with the law? Little is that you mind. One translation, and I could, didn't find it yesterday, says, Little is that what you think, or contemplate, or reflect. So here we say, we go along and we say, Allah removes evil. That's how we think as Muslims. And then if it doesn't look like with our eyes, these physical eyes that he removed it, we know inside of our heart that with our spiritual eyes, it was removed. We might not have the hikmah to understand it, but we know it is removed with our spiritual eyes because Allah said it. In Surah 8 verse 9, you sought aid from your Lord, so the divine answered you, I will assist you with a thousand of the angels following one another. Never think that you are alone. Often I hear people say, I'm so alone. I feel so alone. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a thousand angels at work for you. Angels that are ruh beings. It is not a part of their makeup to even be evil, to harm. It is only a part of their makeup to please Allah. And we are endeavoring to be ruh beings, not nafs beings. And this word nafs is often poorly translated to soul, and in some contexts that is correct, and in some contexts in terms of Islam it is not correct. It has more than one meaning. In Surah 40 verse 60, And your Lord says, Call upon me, I will answer you. Surely those who are too proud to worship me shall soon enter hell abased. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us here to call upon him and that he will answer us. And those who do not call upon Allah, he reminds us that maybe you're being proud. And what do we do when we get angry? And the reason we get angry is because we don't have a need met. There's an unmet need there. And instead of looking at what is Allah said about that unmet need, we go to our nafs, our own lower desires, and we spew out of our mouth something from up here instead of something from here. And these verses, folks, I, I encourage you to take pictures of these verses and to read these verses often when the shaitan is whispering to you and the things that are coming out of your mouth are contrary to what Allah and His Messenger have said, that you go and you read these verses so that you feed the khab. You see, there is, just like there is junk food in, in the food that we eat with our mouth, and there is health food, there is healthy food for the soul, and there is junk food for the soul. So there are a lot of people out there espousing philosophies and and motivational speakers that give people a lot of junk food for the soul. The best food for the soul comes from the Quran, the Quran and the Sunnah. When you differ in a matter, when you differ in a matter, consult Allah and His Messenger, not some person who has sought fame and fortune in this world and has written 10 books on the New York Seller's Best List. In Surah 13, verse 18, For those who respond to the divine, there is goodness. And those who do not respond to the divine, had they all that is in the earth and the like therewith it, they would certainly have it offered, to it, offered it for a ransom. As for those, the latter ones, an evil reckoning shall be theirs, and their abode is hell, 
and evil indeed is their resting place. So, did you say something? Oh, I thought I heard something. Okay. So here we see that if you respond to the divine and the way that we respond to divine is not always just asking, but as we saw in the definition, it's other ways, it's invitation, it's accepting, it's obedience. The way that I respond to Allah is by doing what he has allowed me to do and not doing what he has prohibited me to do. I love this verse. In Surah 8, 24, O you who believe, answer the call of Allah and the Divine's Apostle when he calls you to that which gives you life. And be informed that Allah intervenes between man and woman and his or her heart so that to the divine you shall be gathered. And see here, even in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that heart that has a connection with the brain, that has a connection with the nafs, and has a connection with the ruh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of responding in various ways. Once the divine knows that some of the divine's friends are in need of something, the divine satisfies their need. And the divine may even make some circumstances deliberately hard for them only to test them and raise their status due to their perseverance. And to their th thanking of the divine during the time of ease as well as the time of hardship. In Surah Ankabut it says, Does man believe or think that he will attain to faith with mere words? La, no. I tested them before time and I will test them now to see who is the true among the faults. So when they almost lose hope, the divine comes to their rescue with beautiful rewards and with indications of the divine being pleased with them. So imagine that when you rely, when you have tawakal of Allah, and this ties right into this because tawakkul of Allah, reliance on Allah, what did the messenger of Allah say to the ones who asked him, should I tie my camel or should I have tawakkul reliance of Allah? And in the command verb tense, which is very powerful in the Arabic language, he said you should tie your camel and have reliance of Allah. So we do our part, we do what we're supposed to do. And then we find here that when we do that, we get beautiful rewards and that Allah is pleased with us. Allah guarantees for the divine servants to respond favorably to his or her supplication in the way which the divine knows to be in the best interest of the divine servant. And at the time Allah chooses rather than the time chosen by the divine servant. So do not lose hope. O caller upon Allah, because of the divine's delay and answer your plea, for such a delay may prove to be better for you, as in the case of the insurance. Instead of them having to make their son pay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a way for all of them that was easier. O caller upon Allah, because of the divine's delay in answering your plea, for such a delay may prove to be better for you. Allah may even opt to grant you better than what you asked the divine for. So plead to the divine as one convinced of the divine's favorable response. And this is a kind of conviction, folks, that as your iman grows, as you are strengthened in your iman, you absolutely know that Allah is giving you a favorable response. That whatever is happening in your life, there is something amazing, a reward, a gift in it for you. And I realize that we may not all be there yet. But it's the place that we want to be. It's the place that we aspire to be, inshallah. The Messenger of Allah used to say, plead to Allah while you are convinced of the Divine's answer to your plea. 
and be informed that Allah does not respond to the pleas of one who is inattentive and indifferent. So here we have a responsibility. Here it is our job to be attentive and not to be indifferent. So when I make dua, am I just trying to think, well, what can I say here? I'm supposed to make dua. So, okay, let me, oh, well, I can do this. I can pray for this. And I can. No, it's, where is the ruh in that? Maybe that's where you start. But your desire in your heart is that when you do that, there's a connection with the divine. And there's awareness of what he has promised. Or what Allah has promised. This transmission has also been recorded by a tirmidhi he said, no Muslim pleads to Allah a plea wherein there is no desire for committing a sin nor the severing of the ties of kinship except that Allah will grant him or her one of three good rewards. The divine will either grant him or her an immediate response or the divine may save the rewards for him or her in the life hereafter or the divine may keep away its equivalent of evil. What a blessing. What a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is our responsibility here in these ahadith? Our responsibility is that we must be attentive. Our, atten our responsibility is that we are not to sever the ties of our family. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, his, in Allah's infinite mercy, perhaps will keep away an equivalent amount of evil, or perhaps will reward us in the hereafter, or he, Allah may grant us immediate response. His companion said, then we will plead to the divine a great deal, and the messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Surely Allah is still greater. In other words, no matter how much you do, no matter how much you pray, Allah is greater. And when we stand to pray, what do we do? We say, Allah who akbar, and we put the whole world behind us. Realizing that there is no better place for us to be. Realizing that nothing is more important than this prayer that I'm about to pray. Al-Razi points out that the lot a servant of Allah may acquire of the inspiration of this great name is to bear in mind that Allah Almighty has invited him or her to obey the Almighty. While he or she pleads to the divine to please him or her, so if one answers Allah's call, the divine too will answer his or hers. Here again, if we want these results, we want to increase the likelihood of our prayers being answered, then what do we have to do? We have to answer Allah's call. And this is the mercy of Allah because we fail so miserably at answering the call of Allah and yet Allah continues to bless us abundantly. He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even abundantly blesses those people who are not of faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in Surah 8, 24, Answer the call of Allah and Allah's messenger when he calls upon you. So do answer Allah's call and respond to people when they request something of you. If someone asks you for something, do not rebuke him or her. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah 94, verse 10, And as for the one who asks, do not chide him or her. And there's such a beautiful story in the Holy Quran I, about a blind man who approached the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he was doing da'wah to some very influential people. And he sort of, may Allah bless him, overlooked the blind man. Like, I'm busy right now, dude. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reprimanded the messenger of God in the most beautiful way. Was, he, was it a sin? No. 
But it was something that the messenger of Allah was shown by Allah, don't ever push away the one that might be the one really asking questions of you. So we have a responsibility to respond to the call of our family members, of our ummah, when they come and they ask us for help. A believer's lot and obligation is to repeat this great name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quite often and to fashion his or her conduct mean, means the satisfying of the needs of those who approach him or her so that Allah may satisfy his or her needs and he or she has to respond to the pleas of those who plead to him or her so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may respond to his or her pleadings. And when we look at the ruh, and we're talking about the nafs and the connection to the qalb, the heart, and the connection to the brain, we know that everything in Islam is collective. It's not an individualistic place, faith that says it's all about me. It's all about what I want. It talks about the ummah. It reminds us that if we want to get the best from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we must give the best to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ahmed is quoted supplicating thus, Lord, just as you have protected my face, myself, <coughs> against prostrating to anyone besides you, I plead to you to likewise protect my face against pleading to anyone other than you. So here we see a dua where we are asking Allah, Oh Allah, protect me from ever asking. So we know that some Muslims will go to the graves of great Muslims and what will they do? They will pray to those people. Some people will say, oh, let the angels do this for me. Oh, some people will say, and let Jesus do this for me. It should be our prayer that we never get caught up in this kind of shell. This is polytheism. Imam Ghazali has indicated that a servant of Allah should first respond to the call of his or her Lord, glory and exalted to the divine and whatever the divine has ordered him or her to do or not to do, and to respond to whatever the divine has created him or her to do, then to the divine servants, through whatever the divine has blessed him or her of means of helping them in making anyone who approaches him or her for a favor happy by doing so or by giving them a beautiful answer if he or she cannot. And oftentimes people say to me, I'm not going to give that homeless person any money. They probably own drugs anyway. And I think, oh my God. What about the mercy of Allah? There, by the mercy of Allah, go I. I could be there. I could be that person. And what does that speak to? It speaks a lot about where we are operating from. A servant of Allah ought to adorn his or her conduct with the adornment of the light of this great name of Allah, Al-Mujib by responding to the call of Allah and the Almighty's Messenger through Allah's help and to respond with knowledge when he or she is asked for it and he or she has it or with wealth if he or she is wealthy or with the assistance of someone wronged who pleads to him or her to help him or her as such as he or she can. A servant of Allah should not overestimate whatever he or she pleads Allah for, nor should he or she tire of asking the Almighty for more and more. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi has said, when you have a plea and whenever you need help, seek help from Allah. Allah is too shy to disappoint any servants who pleads to the divine for what is good. Verily Allah is shy to leave Allah's servants empty handed. And I just lifted a few ahadith regarding Allah's desire. 
subhanahu wa ta'ala to hear from you. In reflections from Allah and explanation of the divine names and attributes by Ahmad ibn Ajiba al Hassani, Allah answers those who call upon Allah. Allah is gracious toward those whom the supplicants put forward as intermediaries, wasila, in their prayers. The divine relieves the needs of the hopeful. Allah gives before being asked, and Allah fulfills the wishes of his servants with beautiful gifts after Allah is asked. When a need comes to the mind of one of the divine's friends, Allah grants to him or her swiftly and before his or her tongue mentions it. This is so amazing that so often we didn't, we were not aware of it consciously and some amazing thing comes from Allah and what do we say? Allah answered my prayer. It is mentioned in the aphorisms, if in spite of intense supplication, the divine gift is delayed, let it not be the cause of your despair. For the divine has guaranteed your response in what the divine chooses for you, not in what you choose for yourself, and in the time the divine wants, not in the time that you want. And Ibn Atayla al Sakandari, um, this was part of his writings. He or she who knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al Mujib will continually supplicate for all things large and small and will not ask of others, relying instead on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's response and mercy. Afterwards, when his or her certainty grows stronger, and he or she is overcome by the station of satisfaction known as Ridda. He or she will suffice him or herself with Allah's knowledge of his or her state instead of asking. Ridda or Ridda? Ridda. 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 Because Ridda means when you... What did I do? Put a shadow on it? Yeah. Okay. Ridda Sorry. Ridda the one who no. Sorry, sometimes in my Arabic, and please always correct me, but since we have the camera going, people get to hear this too. So please correct me um, because sometimes I, I don't do these things well. So please forgive me. May Allah forgive me too. It is mentioned, paraphrased, in the aphorisms that sometimes propriety leads the servants to forego asking because of their confidence in the divine's providence and because the remembrance of the divine preoccupies them from asking the divine. So let your asking be out of servitude, ubudiyya, and propriety with lordship, not out of seeking the fulfillment of your own interest. So here when we make dua, it is an act of worship. And we are doing it because we are obeying Allah. It's not about because this is what I want. I better, I'm going to invest a whole lot of time in this du'a because I want this. No, I'm doing du'a because Allah has commanded me to do it. And if your ruh is connected and your, your akal, your spiritual intelligence has the right information, then this is how you will think. But if you're getting a signal from your nafs or for some motivational speaker that doesn't know the Quran and the Sunnah, then how will you think? You will think whatever you've heard. And that is what? If you're getting your help from other than Allah, shuk. it's shuk. It's very deep, sort of surprising, but that's what it is. For exalted is the pre-eternal divine decree above being linked with contingent causes. Verily the divine's providential giving preceded supplication. How do we connect with this name? One should connect with this name by seeking a response from Allah before supplicating. And by not presuming your request too great. For Allah is greater than all that is sought. The things that we pray for are minuscule. They are minute when we look at the majesty, 
majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we cultivate this name in our character? One should cultivate this name in their character by responding to those who ask your help in religious or worldly matters. For never was the messenger of Allah asked for something to which he said no. Wasallam. Responding in matters of religion pertains to knowledge. If a person is asked about something and the questioner is worthy of an answer, he or she should respond, otherwise silence is more appropriate. If you have the answer, it is an act of worship to give it. If you don't know the answer, in the adabs, in the etiquettes of a Muslim, we say Allah knows best. I do not know the answer to that. It is mentioned in the aphorisms, whomsoever you see answering every question put to him or her, expressing everything he or she has witnessed, and mentioning all that he or she knows, infer from all of that the existence of his or her ignorance. A powerful, powerful station, one that stings a little bit. Well, stings, period. Because we meet those people in the world who are very connected to their nafs, and what do we call them? Know-it-alls. They know everything. You can't ask them a question that stumps them. But on that final day, when there is no shade, will they know Allah? Realization of this name, and may Allah protect us from being among those people. One will realize this name by acquiring the quality of magnanimity in one's heart, so that one is unable to refuse those who ask of them or by acquiring knowledge so one is able to answer difficult questions as if they were self-evident, as well as the state of our Messenger of God وسلم, when he spoke upon the pulpit or in other places. In reflections from the 99 names of God, we take the following. The best way to see signs of Allah is to pray. This can main, mean doing salat, the obligatory prayers, in which we stand, bow, and prostrate whilst reciting words from the Qur'an. It can also mean taking the time to speak to Allah, sharing our hearts and dreams. This is called supplication or making dua. It can also mean doing dhikr, repeating the beautiful names of Allah with reverence, love, and gratitude. So I'm praying, it is my dua, that as you are learning these names, that periodically you review them, and you call on Allah, and your part of remembering Allah and being connected with the Divine is knowing that particular attribute which you're looking for in Allah in that moment. We must try to be present when we pray. We are taught to pray with kushuk with presence of heart. So we must pray, we must be present when we pray. If we are thinking about lunch, this is not really praying. Al-Mujib responds to prayers made with presence. We may not always get the response we want and it may not come in the form we imagine nor at the time we expect. Al-Mujib is the responder to prayer. Allah loves us to pray and always hears us when we do. Allah always responds to prayers from a pure heart. In the 40 hadiths of Nawi, Hadith al Qudsi, that's what I was trying to find up there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that, that He is pure. And he only accepts that which is pure. If you want to increase your return on spiritual things, then purify yourself. Purify your thoughts. Purify what you listen to. Purify where you go. And we have to be very careful. 
PG-13 is a very iffy character. So this week I thought, oh, I could go to a movie. It's PG-13. And uh, in that movie, there was nudity. I cannot imagine this, that in a PG-13 movie there would be nudity. So you have to be very careful about what you subject your eyes to. And your naps will tell you, oh, it's just everybody, that's everybody sees that. I mean, even children at school, they will, it will try to justify your bringing contamination to your soul. So I ask a lot to help me and to help you so that we become aware, that we are cautious about the diet, the spiritual diet that we have. The messenger of God said, call unto God with certainty that your prayer will be answered and know that God does not answer a supplication which comes from a heedless and distracted heart. That heart, there's a connection, folks. There's a connection with that heart and with the nafs. There's a connection with the heart and the ruch. There's a connection with that heart and the akal, the brain. God responds, and I love this story. I remember hearing this story as a child. A man whose house was in the middle of a flood prayed to be saved. A neighbor came by in a rowboat and shouted, Get in! No! The man replied, God will save me. The water rose, so the man went upstairs. The police came by in a motorboat and shouted, Get in! No! He said, God will save me. <laughs> Finally, the man was standing on the roof of his house because the water had reached so high. When a helicopter flew over, dropping a ladder, they shouted, Grab on and come into the helicopter. The man replied, No, and shouted back, God will save me. After he was swept away and drowned, he asked God, Why didn't you save me? God said, Didn't I send two boats and a helicopter? <laughs> So, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can be among those people who really know Al-Mujib. Who experience Al-Mujib in our prayer life and in our life of dua. And whose ruh becomes connected to this great teaching of Allah and His Messenger so that we can live spiritually abundant lives. So we're going to have a little discussion based on the questions that I'm going to bring up in just a minute. And um, I love you all for the sake of Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So here we have some questions and some reflections so that uh, you may share. Um, anyone in the class would like to share, we will finish off by this. Make a habit of talking to Allah, of sharing your hopes and dreams, and asking for help. When you pray, does your mind sometimes wonder? Notice when this happens, so you can bring your attention back to your prayer. If we prayed for something selfish or foolish, do you think Allah will grant our wish? Mahatma Gandhi said, prayer is not an old woman's idle amusement. Properly understood and applied, it is the most potent instrument of action. When have you felt the power of prayer? And by the way, the Messenger of Allah said that du'a is the weapon of the believer. Just a, another hadith that came into my heart here. So if you want to ha be armed in a positive way to have the most abundant spiritual life, then you will be making du'a consistently. Ya Allah. Ya Mujib. Ya Mujib. Ya Raqib. Ya Latif. And when you're doing it, you're aware of the promise of the characteristics in that name. So anyone like to share, ask questions, make comments, make contributions? So I would, um, when I pray, my mind wanders and wanders a lot. Like, I will literally have to repeat my prayer because I don't remember if I did. One, two, three, four. And there are some 
notes on some of the great companions of the Messenger of God, وسلم, who repeated their prayers because they became aware that they were not praying efficaciously. That will help train you. If you repeat your prayers, prayers enough times, it will help you. The other thing is that I recommend to you, and we have a human condition we have to deal with, and that's the world, but I would recommend to you that you get yourself in the spirit of prayer, that you create some kind of ritual. What most of us do, and, and, I, and I get, when I have a client, I try to get them out so I can get my prayer before the next client sometimes. And it's really challenging. So we look for ways, we work hard to try to get that prayer in and to get it prayed on time. Did that? Yeah. So look for ways that you can, can do that. Um, yes, more please. Wudu before the prayer. Even if you're in wudu, you make wudu again. Noor ala noor. Wudu and the wudu. Yeah. Now, I think that's amazing, um, Omar, because what I used to do and periodically go back to that is I think about, I actually process the wudu. So I'm actually washing my hands all the way up to my elbow in order to remind me that I want to keep this clean. I want everything that happens with this must be clean. If you do the extra sunnas of rinsing your mouth and your nose out, I actually would process, okay, I don't want to use this for anything dirty. And I'm going to keep my nose, I, this is just how I used to think, I'm going to keep my nose out of other people's business. So I'm cleaning my nose. And then I, I'm wiping down, I'm cooling off this egotistical head of mine that thinks it's so great. So I, I bring my hands over my head. So I would process that as I did that. Um, and that really, really helped me as to really think about what am I doing here and, and, and let me share with you with with all the hub in my heart all the love in my heart when you hear the Adhan what's happening Allah is calling you to prayer and what happens and this is a disease people think I've got to finish my story so the Adhan God has called you to prayer and you are talking now you've speeded up because what you got is so important. What are we supposed to do when you hear the Adhan? Repeat it. You're supposed to repeat it. And ponder. And ponder and reflect over it. And prepare yourself for the Akama. And you... The howl of and so I was, you took my uh, lines thank you sister I, I love it I love this so absolutely so if you want to know something when you hear that and then close your mouth zip it zip your lip tater chip that's it <laughs> I'm not talking now and get in the habit of saying bring yourself to the prayer because how can you get there when you're telling a story that has to do with the dunya all of a sudden the person starts calling the akama and your story is so important you're still talking now i'm not whipping you i'm not spanking you i'm not beating you up i'm giving you a message of love because So when, when the, and this is beautiful because when the Mu'adhan is calling us to success and to prayer, we actually acknowledge, la hawla wa la billah, there is no power or might save Allah. Now imagine, I'm telling a story about the worth of la hawla wa la and I don't even know what I've said. I'm not aware that there's no power or might of Allah because the only power that's going on right now is I'm running my lip. So if you really, really want to get into the, the state of prayer, for sure, the first habit you want to get is when you hear the then you stop talking. I don't care what you're talking about, you stop talking. Yeah, there are like different ways of <coughs> praying. Like for example, sometimes 
after the salah, there is a masnoon a dua, which Prophet Sallallahu used to say. So it's like a, you know, mm -hmm. all written and you memorize those. And the sum, like having conversation, like he's right here with you, and you're having conversation, like a daily problem conversation, and you're asking him to, you know, whatever you need. So there's another kind of asking him. And the one kind, Allah said, if you keep if you keep doing zikr of Allah, zikr means anything, namaz, salah, Quran, zikr, then Allah said, I will give you more than the people they ask me. Yes. And then in the last way, like Allah said, if you run for someone, I will run for you. Yes. So there is another way if mm. you want to, you know, accept your dua to be accept, to help others, so Allah will help you. Other comments, questions, sharing? How about anyone when uh, you've actually felt the power of prayer? So many times. Unlimited. Yeah. Unlimited. Oh Unlimited. When you didn't think a bill was going to get paid and then all of a sudden you got money you weren't expecting. Sometimes I tell people I'm a walking miracle. Hmm. If you don't believe on miracles, look at me, uh, my story and my life how Allah helped me out from bad times. Anything else? Okay. Um, oh, yes, sorry, thank you. I wanted to ask, um, you were mentioning some parts about how you sometimes, we don't know if we're following our nafs or our actual soul. And I wanted to ask, what do you do personally to make sure that you're keeping your ego in check? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I know what you mean. Um, well, I, I am very attentive to the sensations in my body. Um, I don't know if this is going to sound strange to you. May Allah help us all. But I, what I know, the, the Prophet said to know yourself is to know Allah. And so when I receive a certain sensation in my body, it's a message. It's like the self-approaching soul. If I don't feel good about something, I trust that. So you're intuitive. So maybe intuition is, is the word. Because uh, of Ilham, of Wahi, the one of the eight forms of revelation that's still available to human beings is inspiration. Nobody's going to get any more revelation. That's done. There's a seal on that. But God, in his infinite love for us, does inspire us to have feelings that guide us. So you'll get, a, you'll get like not a verbal message, like you're schizophrenic or something, but you just get this message like, I don't need to be here. This, this is not a good place for me to be. So I obey, I trust my feelings, but I examine them against Quran and Sunnah. That's one way I know, I'm, I know that I'm from my ruh and not from my nafs. Because if, for example, uh, someone is gossiping and you say to them, you know, you might not want to talk about that person because they might not like what you're saying and it's not healthy. The person says, I know, but it's the truth. Your nafus may desire to hear it, but your ruh will say that my messenger, may Allah be pleased with him, said that even if it's the truth, you do not reveal it except for certain situations. So you always examine, is, my, is what's coming from my aqal, is the signal that's coming to my heart and moving up and just about to spew it out, vomit it out, is it coming from the messenger and Allah or is it coming from my own desires? And that's how I do it. Um, this, I, I deem by Allah that this peace, that it's just so invaluable for us to become aware of who we are, to measure ourselves as to where we are moving in our Iman. You know, am I awake most of the time spiritually? Am I aware or about half the time I'm walking and sleepwalking? I'm on automatic pilot. Well, I'm a humble, I'm a Muslim. Salaam alaikum. But the next second I'm doing something that's, in most of the seconds, I'm doing something, and I'm saying hypothetical here, if I'm doing something that isn't aligning itself with the characteristic of a Muslim, then how can that be from my ruh? This is why 
um, <coughs> aqidah, correct understanding is so vital to the Muslim. So when, when you go to the masajid uh, after becoming a Muslim, all these people say, Islam, we're supposed to do so and so. But they don't give you the proofs, the dalil. So you go and you tell the next person, oh, well, the, the, somebody told me in the masjid I'm supposed to do so and so. So there's an uncertainty there because you haven't been given the proofs. And, and this is why it is so important that people have a teacher. Um, there, there are some folks in here that have been a Muslim a long time. They've obviously had some good teachers because I hear what they present. But you need to make sure that whatever you say, you have proofs for what you say. Yeah. I find a lot of, that's so, such an important part of being able to adapt and apply what we learn to our day-to-day -day, day -day lives because coming from a Palestinian family, there's so much more culture than there is religion then there is the actual teachings of Islam. They will be more worried about the reputation of the family name than they are about what Allah is going to say about whatever action is coming forward. So it makes it almost um, suffocating. Struggle. It's a huge struggle, but it's like suffocating to be around because you're like, who cares what this person thinks or that person thinks? This is, we're ultimately going to answer to Allah. No one's going to be able to fend for me or help me on that day so it's just but let me say this to you about that a friend of mine said there's no line of business like any line of business like minding your own business and I want to tell you where I'm coming from with that <laughs> there, there's no line of business in any line of business like minding your own business so if I am minding my business my business my spiritual business, then I don't have time to look around and say what Leith's doing wrong or what Camila's doing wrong or what Bonnie's doing wrong or, and I could go right down the whole list. I'm going to be so focused on my own nafus or my nafs, nafus is plural, my own nafs and I'm going to be so focused on my ruh to make sure that I'm pleasing my Lord instead of getting the toothpick out of your eye, I'm going to get the telephone pole out of my eye. Because if you look at most of the people that are very critical, a lot of times, these people that are very critical and they have all these cultural mores, they, are, they don't know themselves. And, and matter of fact, they'll be angry and their wife will say to them, why are you so angry? I'm not angry, what are you talking about? There's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> what are you talking about? They don't even know themselves. You know, and you, the whole world can see that this person's angry and they're in denial. And everybody laughed because you've, been, you've had that experience before in life. So th the key here Never. is that when your family is doing this stuff, you say, well, I was there one day. I did that. I still do that now and then. So I'm going to extend the hand of mercy to them, and I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on how I can keep my soul pure before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is a struggle. Because we know that families have a tie on you like no other. Like say, can you contain yourself? You cannot change Well said. Yeah, but, but that struggle is a part, is an opportunity for may soon to strengthen your iman. Because I, let me tell you, particularly as a revert, and I'm not trying to say I've got the monopoly on it because I know people that are born in Islam that have struggles. But as a revert, I have to tell myself a lot. My family cannot understand me. Sure, they can't understand me. Sure, they think I'm a terrorist. With all the Fox and CNN that they're watching and the fact that maybe they voted for a particular candidate, um, how can they possibly understand? So I want to be raqib. I want to just give the mercy and the kindness to them. And in my silence, in my quietude, I'm I am connected with my Lord because I'm doing it for that reason. But I can easily hook into my nafs and my ego and then I can get into a, a verbal contest with them. 
And I can tell them how wrong they are, but when I'm telling them how wrong am I, am I looking at how wrong I am? Because I'm not telling them with beautiful words and eloquent speech, let me tell you. When I start criticizing, how many people have been criticized, criticized with beautiful words and eloquent speech? You have? Oh. <laughs> then I would, I would change the word of that from criticism to nasiha. To nasiha. And, and, and spiritual advice. Because my intention is not to criticize. Do you see the difference? See, I don't like the term constructive criticism because criticism is criticism. Do you feel it's constructive? Usually, no. So, I want to give you a piece of constructive criticism. Okay, let me brace myself because I know the windstorm is going to come now. <laughs> yeah, because you've got a load for me, but you want to, you're going to put it out there. It's like, I, I want to share something with you. Woo, we all know when we hear that, we need to brace yourself because the tornado is coming. Guard your heart. Keep your connection to Allah, and may Allah make all of us to get there. I'm certainly not there. I want to be there so badly. But it is a second-by-second second process that you reconnect to Allah, that you keep your spiritual eyes. And when you read these beautiful verses in the Quran, and I, I do... I um, want to teach this to you at some point. It's so crystal clear that Allah is not talking about these eyes, but He's talking about the eyes of the heart and the ears of the heart. You must pay more attention to these eyes and ears than these. My grandfather had a saying on a plaque in his store that said, the good Lord gave you two ears and one tongue. Use them in that proportion. I so wished I had that. And that's just with these eyes and ears and tongue. But this one in the heart looking to see, is this coming from my nafs or is this coming from my ruh? Is what I'm listening to good for my soul or is it damnation to my soul? And when it's damnation, say, you know what, I'm not feeling good about this. Comment. People ask me, how do you do this? And it's very simple. You know what? I, I, Somehow I feel dis-ease about this conversation. I'm feeling uncomfortable with this conversation. If I was to say that to any of you, would that offend you? Yes. It would? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that behavior is learning to take care of yourself spiritually. I just want to speak to one more thing because that's uh, amazing. Um, I made the mistake, and you'll understand why it was a mistake later. When my mother was struggling so much with the fact that I became a Muslim, I said to her, Mom, I'm always going to love you. I'm going to love you because Allah has commanded that from me. But she said, I don't want you to love me because of Allah. I want you to love me because I'm your mother. But you got to understand, you got to meet people where they're at, folks. My mother, first of all, is resistant to Allah as a concept. She can't understand. She's not willing to listen. And so she became to think about her nafs, her ego, I. I want you to love me because of who I am. But she doesn't know that. So since I know that, 
I have a responsibility to let it go. Say peace to the ignorant. This is what the Quran says. Say peace. I'm not being dis derogatory. She literally does not know that information. So it wasn't a compliment to her. To me, I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. You, you've cut me out of your will. You refused me to come to your home. You've done all these things. And now you're not happy that I, <laughs> I'm going to love you no matter what you do to me. So you have to know that sometimes people will not understand where you're coming from if you are operating according to the Quran and the Sunnah. They are ignorant of that. And they cannot understand. In the Bible, there's an interesting verse that said, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness to him. And we, we have to know that this is the case. So I love you all for the sake of Allah. Is there any more comment? Just one more time. Anybody? Yes, Omar. So yeah, this, this Omar here. They are veiled. Yes. The concept of Allah does not pass the veil. Yeah. They're locked out. And, and you have to recognize that. And, and uh -huh. alhamdulillah, our mercy is that that veil is lifted. Yes. And that's our dua and our prayer. That, and every day I pray, O oh Allah, Please bring my mom to Islam. Inshallah. So my father came, my stepmother came. Now all we're waiting for is my mom to come. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.